we've been looking at how to deal with trouble or when trouble comes to the church. And trouble is inevitable because churches are made up of people and people come in sometimes with hurts and problems and struggles. And so because of that, we bump into each other and it causes problems and and friction. And and, uh, it's real easy. It's much easier to say, let's not deal with it. Let's sweep it under the carpet. Let's ignore it, hoping that it goes away. But how's that work for you? Does it work usually too well? And so this morning, we want to again look at God's word for what does the Lord tell us to do on how to deal with the inevitable when the inevitable comes? So as I've been posing to you over the last uh, weeks, questions of uh, situations that can happen in a church, happens in churches. I I wish that they were hypothetical, but they're not because uh, as I work with churches and and pastors um, and and Christians, uh, they are uh, quite uh, common. So what do you do when uh, two Christians will no longer speak to each other? Or one of uh, our Bible study teachers denies the deity of Christ. What, What do you do with that as a church? What do we do when a leader criticizes another leader behind her back? Or a Christian businessman cheats another man in the church? What do you do? What do you do when an usher is caught stealing from the weekly offering? Ooh, what do you do with that? Or two couples begin spreading rumors that a deacon is using illegal drugs. Oh, my goodness. What do you do when someone says they have a prophetic word from God, but it isn't confirmed by others and it doesn't come true? What do you do with that? And what do you do when the pastor refuses to preach in accordance with the scriptures. What, what does the church do? What does the leadership do? Now, I wish, I, I, I wish that these were hypothetical situations, but the reality is that they happen every day in churches all across America. A professor of mine, Gordon McDonald, wrote in his book, Restoring Fellowship. This is what he writes. Today, the contemporary church struggles with the subject of discipline. It is not a pop, it's not popular to judge one another, nor is it easy to confront one another. Many would rather ignore sin than go through the struggle of facing it and forgiving it under proper conditions. But we cannot hope for an effective ministry and neglect the purification of our lives and our fellowship. And so when it comes to the topic of of discipline, it's important that when we come to it, we understand some things. And so I want to give you uh, three important key things overarching to remember when we talk about this tough topic of church discipline. First, although it is often overlooked, church discipline has long been regarded as one of the three primary marks of the true church. I don't know if you knew that. But throughout history, three marks, church discipline, the preaching of the gospel, and the administration of the ordinances, the Lord's Supper and baptism. Lord's Supper and baptism, preaching of the gospel, and church discipline. Second, biblical church discipline always goes beyond our natural impulses to get mad, to tell someone else, or to sweep it under the rug. And to the contrary, church discipline faces problems head on. It confronts sin, upholds the name of Jesus Christ, and then seeks to win an erring brother or sister back to the Lord. Discipline is not for the purpose of punishment. Or for revenge. On the contrary, its purpose is to correct and to restore. So a third overarching principle is that church discipline has three great purposes at heart. One, to protect the honor of Jesus Christ. Number two, to preserve the purity of the church. And three, to restore an erring believer. And so with those overarching themes, I want to look at this topic. And this is a crucial subject, as as Gordon McDonald states, because the very health, the very health and well-being of the church is at stake. And it begs the question, 
How do we handle trouble in the church? And not if trouble comes, but how do we handle trouble when <laughs> it comes? Because it will come. Now, you may, be, you may not be surprised by this, but Jesus doesn't leave us hanging. He never does. He addresses this topic head on. And it's, it's comforting to know that he addresses this topic head on and likewise gives us guides and a, a process, steps that he wants us to take. So let's look at that once again. We looked at it a little earlier, but let's uh, refamiliarize ourselves with it. From Matthew 18. If your brother sins against you, Go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens, you have won your brother over. But if you will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, well, then... Treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus gives us four basic steps, a process that we should follow in handling basically any type of trouble in the church. Step one, go to the person. Church discipline begins with something as simple as one person going to another person. It doesn't need to be anything highly organized. It doesn't have to be overly emotional. It is simply one friend helping another friend correct some mistake that they may have made. But in order for this to be effective, again, three things are required. It needs to be personal, it needs to be private, and it needs to be timely. Not three months from now, not six months from now or a year from now. You know, a year ago, you said something and it hurt my feelings. I did. I don't even remember what I had for breakfast this morning. I don't remember what I did. So it has to be timely, personal, yes, and private. Now, most problems can be dealt with on, on this basis. And most church struggles, most of them come about because we would rather do anything else than go to that person with this issue. Am I not right? Right? We say, oh, I hate it. Confrontation. I just can't stand it. And we would rather, we would rather conversely, instead of going to that person, it's much easier to go to somebody else or ignore it and hope it goes away or, or just forget about it. Right? But these approaches, you know, they only make the matter worse. And as difficult as it is to go to someone and, and even confront someone, not confronting them or going to them makes the matter worse. But you might say, well, what if they laugh at me? Or worse, what if they get angry at me? Or what if they say, you don't know what you're talking about. I didn't do that. Well, Jesus says, then if that's the case, then there's another step. Step two, Go with someone else. Now, at this point, matters have gotten maybe just a little bit more serious. A third party is involved as a witness to the proceedings. And things are, are still private, but you know what? They're not as private as they had been before. Going with someone else protects you from false accusations. And it also impresses on the person being seen th the seriousness of this. But what happens if after that happens, they still refuse to listen? Well, then Jesus says, you have to go to step three, don't you? He says, tell it to the church. Now, I want to emphasize here that there is a huge gap between step two and step three. When you tell it to the church, the matter is no longer private. It's no longer confidential. And such a step should only be taken after you have exhausted all the means of attempting to deal with it. You may circle back with that person and say, you know what, we've, we've kind of talked about some heavy issues today. Could we get together next week and go back over it? Do you know how I, I am sometimes? I, I need some time to process some things, you know. At first it kind of hits me right here in the chest, and I need to think about it and pray about it and have my wife say to me, yeah, you were wrong, George, you know. And, and then, yeah, yeah process, right? And, and as my good friend, Pastor Rod Henry says, process always stinks. And so that's the hard part of it. But circling back to it and uh, 
uh, with the person, giving that person a chance to kind of think through it. Step three must not be taken lightly. Now, telling it to the church does not necessarily mean that we announce it to the congregation. On Sabbath morning, Pastor Knight comes up in the, at the prayer time and says, confession, I want to talk about this person here. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about taking the matter to a church leader, taking it to the pastor, a team leader. And why take such a drastic step? Well, you do this only when the issue, the behavior, the sin is such a magnitude that it begins to threaten the, the life and well-being of the congregation. Now, now, folks, this is not an exact science. I wish it was a lockstep, very cut and dry. You know, I once had, had someone come to me for counsel about an issue concerning another person. And after talking with me, they came to me for, for counsel. I said, you need to go and talk to that person. And they said, you know what, I, I, I feel uncomfortable. I, I just do. Going and talking to them. I said, okay, well, then maybe you could take someone along with you because of that. And they said, would you come along with me? And I said, I would. And so I went along with them, and they were able to talk, and it was able to be resolved. It was a, a serious enough issue that was dealt with pri- in, in private, that was personal, and it was timely. But the question is, what if even that doesn't work? What if the situation continues to digress and and get worse and and, and it continues to grow? What if after steps one through three are applied and the behavior continues and even escalates? Well, well, what then? Does does the church then say, well, ignore it, you know, just kind of sweep it under a rug or just say, you know, heck, uh, you know, we tried our best, but there's, there's nothing we can do about it. You know, they're not going to apologize. They're not going to repent. They're not going to forgive. They're not going to make it right. I mean, what do we do? I guess we can't do anything. Well, again, Jesus doesn't leave us hanging. He says, if they refuse to listen, even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Step four. Now, this means maybe withdrawing them from fellowship, even terminating their membership. And the exact form may, may vary, uh, of course, from church to church. church but the principle it, it remains the same. Be- because of their obstinate refusal to listen to godly counsel, they now may be treated as if they were an unbeliever and no longer a part of the fellowship, no longer a part of the church. Now, this step is, is by far the most severe and should only be taken in, in extreme circumstances. So I want to be absolutely, absolutely clear here about the biblical steps by giving you three vital observations. You notice there will be a lot of threes in this today. First, the steps are progressive. Each one is more severe than the previous one. Second, each step is meant to be a final point in the process. That is, if if personal uh, confrontation, the first step, solves the problem, then it solves the problem. You don't need to go on to step two. Thank God, huh? It stops there. Repentance, forgiveness, restoration are always the option that we desire and, and strive for. But likewise, you never go to step three or four until the previous steps have been tiredly exhausted, exhausted. You know, it's been my experience that that most problems are are solved at step one and two. Perhaps 1% goes to step three and four, and and it should be rare. It should be rare. If I had to guess at the percentage of problems that are solved at each step, I think the numbers would look something like this. Step one, 90%. Step two, 10%. Step three, one percent. Step four, less than one percent. But the question for us is, is it really reasonable? And this is the question I have for you today. Is it really reasonable to expect our church to actually follow this biblical pattern to solving internal problems? I mean, can we expect that of ourselves? And should we? After all, it's much easier, isn't it, to just ignore it, hope it goes away, or 
talk about it in the parking lot. I, I mean, that's much easier, you know, and, and a little more fun, right? I mean, this takes work. And even more, it, it takes an abundance of God's love. It takes an empowering of the Holy Spirit to risk something, to risk having a healthy church. Wow. Risking to have a healthy church. 1 Peter 4, eight says, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sin. Now, in other words, don't get all nitpicky on people. You know, looking for every flaw in person. Uh, person. That's not what we're talking about. I'm not asking you to sign up to be a parlor Nazi. Okay? You know, you know what I'm saying? Kind of controlling the parlor. Looking for indiscretions. Looking for, that's not what we're talking about here. So, on the one hand, remember, remember this always to take the plank out of your own eye before you attempt to take the speck out of your brother's eye. But on the other hand, we are called to speak the truth in love for the purpose of correcting and restoring. Now, I know there's a fine line. I know it's a narrow road, but that's what God calls us to do. I I mean, that's what he's asking us to do to do. And he never asks us to do anything that he doesn't first equip us to do it. So lean hard upon him in this process so you can trust him and obey him in the process. But the question still looms before us. Will we ever dare go to steps three and four if the circumstances required it? Would we dare go there? Now, some of you may say, no. But I think the answer must be yes. Yes. It has to be on the table. We must at least be willing to do these things if we are going to be faithful to God's word and be healthy as a church. You see, we know the early church took these things seriously. If you recall... A couple weeks ago, I I spoke on this, and Paul told the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 5, do you remember the situation? I'll read it right from Scripture. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even the pagans don't tolerate. So in other words, the people that didn't go to church said, you people are weird. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. It's in the Bible right here. Look, look, right there. Yeah, it says right there. A man is sleeping with his father's wife, and even the pagans were going, ooh, And you're proud of it. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of the fellowship the man who was doing this? I mean, so that was the problem that was going on in in the church. I mean, this is not reality TV, right, on on Lifetime. This This is first century, first century. However, do you remember what we learned in Paul's second letter about the situation? If you recall in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul tells them, The punishment inflicted on him, on this man, by the majority is sufficient. They put him out. Now, instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Boy, they got it right. Didn't they? I mean, let's face it. We've faced problems. We've had people go through some terrible struggles. We've had to deal with the issue and and help them work through it, and then restore them, and restore them. And this passage clearly shows the benefit when church discipline is properly applied. Its ultimate goal is to restore the offender to Christian fellowship. In the beginning, the judgment seemed harsh. It even seemed unloving. But in the end, it produced incredible growth and blessing that came through the pain. And see, by exposing the erring brother to the pain of separation, the Holy Spirit worked in him to bring him back to to God and bring him back to the church. Now, let me ask you, what do you think this church in Corinth look like in order for this to work? What did this church look like, the Corinthian church? I mean, how did they operate, and and what were they willing to do? Well, I, I think there's several things. First, the church was organized enough to discipline. They were organized enough to discipline. Secondly, the church was alive enough so that someone that was cast out actually missed being there, right? Actually said, oh, I miss 
the church. The third one was the church was committed enough to stick to its tough love rule. And four, the church was obedient enough to dare to do what Jesus said to do. Now, I want to pose some questions to you this morning in our remaining moments that I'll ask and I'll attempt to answer. First, what sins call for church discipline? Hmm. Well, the New Testament presents us with three broad categories of sin that call for some kind of disciplinary response. We're in church. They're broad ones. The precise response will vary with the circumstances, but something must be done in each of these three cases. Blatant immorality. Huge category. Secondly, serious false doctrine. Big category. Third, divisive behavior. Divisive behavior. So, personal, right? Belief, and then interpersonal. Second, When should we overlook the sins of others? Well, here's the best rule I know. You know to overlook those sins in others that you would overlook in yourself if you committed it. Now, I'm not giving you license here to go, well, I'm going to go out there and do a bunch of bad stuff so I don't have to, you know, hold others accountable. I'm not talking about that. I don't mean justifying other people's sins so you can justify your own. That's not, that's not the point here. That, that's not it. What I mean is treat others as you would want them to be treated. It's a golden rule, right? Treat others as you want to be, retreat, be treated. And remember, love covers a multitude of sin. Third question. When is it right to confront another believer? Well, this is the flip side of of the question Jesus gave to you. You must confront, confront when the sin simply cannot be overlooked, when it can't be ignored. You confront it, and when the sin is deliberate or repeated or malicious or injurious to others, you must confront when the, son, when, the, when the individual is dragging others down by their behavior. You must confront when the health of the entire church is at stake. You must be willing to confront when to ignore the behavior would only worsen the situation. Fourth, when should we completely forgive and restore the broken relationship? When should we completely forgive and restore the broken relationship? This is an easy one. We should completely forgive when there's genuine sorrow, when there is repentance, when there's forgiveness. And what are the marks to look for? Well, we kind of sang it this morning, didn't we? A humble and contrite spirit. A refusal to blame others. Accepting full responsibility. A willingness to face the consequences. Anger that is replaced by tears. A willingness to follow godly counsel. And an eagerness to make restitution. Number five. What is the great danger we face in this area? Well, becoming unbalanced and going to extremes. Either we can become harsh, critical, and judgmental on one side, or on the other side, we just become permissive, compromised, and irrelevant. In everything we do, we must, with the power of the Holy Spirit, seek to follow hard after Jesus, who loved sinners, but who hated the sin who loved not because of, but in spite of, who cleansed out the temple with a whip and then prayed for the very men that crucified him. If we will focus on that, we will have both the courage and the compassion to reach out to the fallen and to do the hard work of bringing them back to God. The crying need today, folks, for discipline is seen in in the laxness of modern Christianity. We have substituted rationalization for the clear word of God, and we use excuses instead of obedience, and we tolerate things. We tolerate immorality and laziness and busybodies and false doctrine and divisive behavior, all in the name of Christian love. 
And today, we put up with things in the church that secular organizations don't put up with. I want to conclude with the words, again, of of my professor, Gordon McDonald. He says, as our Western world lapses more and more into an unchristian perspective, and as human behavior is increasingly gauged by Bacon standards, it will become necessary for Christian leaders to raise the standard of holiness and Christian discipline higher. For to rationalize sin and not confront it will be to sow the seeds of ultimate destruction for the church. May we always be a church with a purity of testimony that speaks the truth in love to a watching world.